Yep, I have you pinned. Assalamu okay. alaikum, everybody. Welcome. And uh, we just wait a few more minutes and get started, inshallah. We have MC uh, Brother Ali here. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Alhamdulillah. So, inshallah, we should be getting started soon. Inshallah. My phone says it's seven and five. My laptop says it's seven. Which one is correct? Seven and five, right now. Seven and five. So we can get started. Inshallah. Let's begin. With Surah Al-Fatiha. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. Bismillahi Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Maliki Yawm Al-Din. Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim. Sirat Al-Nadhina An'amta Alayhim. غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين آمين بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومختاره العظيم إن شاء الله today we'll be starting uh, the story of نوح عليه السلام uh, if you were here on our last uh, Last halaqa, we talked about Adam alayhi salam and his descent into the earth. So continuing off where we, where we stopped, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Adam alayhi salam, uh, you know, go down to earth, you and your wife, and you will have there a short time. So the question here is about the origin of humanity. Where did we come from? How did we end up on this earth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in this, in this story about the origin of human beings and how we came down to the earth, right? So Adam alayhi salam, he comes down to earth with his wife, and then he's told that I'm going to send you signs. Uh, and whoever follows the signs, they won't have any kind of fear, nor will they have any kind of fear, uh, you know, grief. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically said, uh, here's the earth, go and uh, live a short time in there. And while you're staying there, there's, there's gonna be choices to make. You can live in the right way or you can live in the wrong way, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'll send you signs. I'll send you guidance. I'll send you prophets. I'll send you revelations to make sure that you choose what is good for you, what will benefit you. And so humanity now is the first generation on the face of the earth, Adam alayhi salam and his wife. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nas, taqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida. O oh, mankind, be conscious of your Lord who created you from a single soul. We talked about how Allah created his mate from him. So both of the human beings, Adam and his wife, they came from a single self. But now Allah says, 
we then we created many men and many women from the two of them. So the first generation of human beings living on the earth now, they start having children. So Adam alayhi salam, Hawa alayhi salam, they start having children and our ulama, they said that every time they had a, a child, they were born as twins, one boy, one girl. And they had about 20, 20 different children. And, and human beings at that time, they were in a different form. They're not like we are today. Imagine somebody have 20 kids back to back today, they're probably gonna, their, their bones will go hollow. But uh, at that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he described to us, Adam alayhi salam, he was 40 cubit feet tall. So he was a giant, right? And uh, people lived a long time also. They lived, you know, up to a thousand years. Or, and uh, Allah had told Adam alayhi salam that Adam alayhi salam, he will live up to a thousand. So Adam alayhi salam's age, according to many of our scholars, was supposed to be up to a thousand years old, except something happened. When Allah created the souls and he brought the souls in front of Adam alayhi salam, he showed him all of his children. And Adam alayhi salam, he liked one of them. He said, Ya Allah, who's that one person? And uh, Allah told him, that's your son Dawood alayhi salam. He will come at the end of time. And Adam alayhi salam said, what's his age? Allah said, 60. So Adam alayhi salam said, give him 40 years from my life. You know, and, and we learned from that, that you can transfer uh, blessings that Allah gave to you to other people. You can say, Allah, I read Quran and I give the good news, uh, the, the blessings of it and the, and the reward of it to my grandfather. You can do that or to all my ancestors. And so here Adam alayhi salam, he asked Allah to give a portion of his life on earth to Dawood alayhi salam. Allah told him the pen will be lifted and the ink will dry. Like, you know, are you sure you're going to live 40 years left? Less Adam alayhi salam said, no problem. And so 40 years from his life was taken. Now, Adam alayhi salam living on the earth, uh, he experienced some hardships. Now imagine you're the first person to live on the earth and all you have is knowledge that Allah gave you. Now you have to put that knowledge into practice, right? Now you have to bring that knowledge and, and, and manifest it in front of you. So how to build a house, how to, how to farm, how to do all those things. Adam alayhi salam had to figure it all out. And uh, it's, it's not an easy thing. Uh, you know, because he has no help. He's, he's basically the only person. So we are fortunate to have cities and roads and buildings and McDonald's you can go to or, you know, different fast food restaurants you can go to. We have all these things established for us from the people that went before us. But Adam Ali Salam, he was the first person. And so he's building everything from the ground up and there was nothing around him, only trees and, you know, so Adam and his wife, they worked very hard to, to build a home and to establish what it was like on this earth. And as they started having children, uh, some qualities of the human beings, you know, because each child that came, uh, are, we, are we losing internet connection? Uh, yeah, I believe you're breaking up a bit. Um, I'm not sure if that's just for me, but it, yeah, it is a little bit choppy. Let me see where I'm actually uh, using a hotspot. So, okay. Let me do this. Were you able to hear everything okay, at least? Yeah, uh, just for the past, um, like the last 15 seconds, it got a little distorted, but otherwise it was. Okay, it was okay alhamdulillah. So Adam alayhi salam, he started having kids and he noticed every child is different than the others. And, and, and this one of the things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, one of the signs of Allah is the, is the difference between the heavens and the earth and the difference between your colors and your tongues. And our, our scholars just said, this is a sign that the humanity, they have these two aspects within them. You have a heavenly quality and you have an earthly quality. And the earthly quality has to do with the shape of your face, the color of your skin, your bone structure, you know, how you look as a person. And your heavenly quality is your, is your language and the way you speak, your, your character, your manners, how you carry yourself. All of that is your heavenly qualities. Now, just like every aspect of the plant life on the earth is different, every fruit you taste is different, the human beings, every single one of them is different, even though they come from the same father and mother. And Adam alayhi salam quickly learned that there's qualities within each one of them that, that, that can either work with the others or not work with the others. 
and it happened that he had a tragedy happen in his life. Uh, so, so people may wonder, like, how did people get married back then? You know, because they're all brothers and sisters. Um, Allah, uh, our scholars just said when Adam alayhi salam and Bibi Hawa, they had the children, every, every batch of uh, children that were born was male and female, twins. And so the, the marriages that was set up between them was, you know, so the ones that came together were considered brother and sister. And the ones that, that came in a different birth, they were, they were allowed to be married to each other. So this was halal for them. Now, of course, this is uh, early Sharia. It's different. Uh, just like if, you know, if you're far away from the Kaaba, you have to face the Kaaba, certain set, set of rules apply. But when you go next to the Kaaba, you know, the Kaaba, you can go in circles around it. So people don't line up in straight lines. People line up in circles. You know what I mean? So, so similarly, human beings, as, as generations move further away from the first person, the laws and the rulings, they change. But when you get to the first generation, they had a completely different set of laws. And so he had two sons. One of them name was Habil, and another one is Qabil. And they both kind of liked the same girl. And uh, they wanted to marry the same girl. And so, so there was a jealousy. There was a, a little bit of animosity and rivalry between them. And, you know, of course, when siblings fight, when brothers fight, uh, the father and the, the mother, they're the ones that suffer most, you know. So, so they, they kept coming to their father like, you know, Habil said this, Habil said this, he did this, he did this. No, she's mine. No, she's mine. So this, this went on for some time. And then things start to escalate. And uh, one of the qualities that they found in Qabil was he had a very fiery personality. Like he had a quick temper. He was, he was easily angered. And also he was uh, unable to see beyond himself. He wanted to be the best at everything. And so Adam alayhi salam, he pleaded with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show him how to resolve this because he's new to parenthood. This is all brand new to him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him advice and tells him, uh, uh, test your children. Whoever can give a sacrifice for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, have them bring something for Allah. Whoever brings something good, you know, based on that, see who's worthy of marrying this daughter. So this is what he does. He says, bring uh, a sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has uh, created this altar for you. When you place your sacrifice there, if a fire comes out and eats what you have brought, then it, the sacrifice is accepted from you. If it doesn't, then it's not accepted from you. So now it's at that time, you know, we have sadaqa, right? You, you give charity and you give it to the poor, you give it to the needy. At their time, there was no such a thing because there's only one, one family. And so who are you going to give money to? Who are you going to give anything to? So this is purely sadaqa for Allah's sake. You're giving something up purely for the sake of Allah. And so they had to choose what is worthy gift to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, this practice has lasted uh, many, many different generations of different prophets. They had this. Even in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Jews, they challenged Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said, why don't you come and bring us a a sacrifice and we see the fire taken. That's how we know you're a real prophet. And uh, Rasulullah was told to tell them, other prophets came to you with the same thing you're asking for, but you killed them. Why did you kill the prophets of Allah? You know, so, so this was something that this is not, of course, something that doesn't happen in the world anymore. But back in the time, there, there was these things that would happen. And so Habil and Qabil, they both go and they bring uh, their, their, their sacrifice. And Habil says, you know, this is going for Allah. I don't care if I, if I, if I get the hand of my, my you know, beloved or not. I'm going to sacrifice the best thing I have for Allah. So he brings the best that he has. While Qabil is like, what do I not need? You know, what can I do without? So he chooses something he doesn't need. So one, and, and this, is, this is very symbolic. Some people, for example, when they give donations, right? They want to give, they want to give sadaqah. They, they give the best that they have. And this is true sadaqah. While others, they say, I'm not using this anymore. This shirt has a hole in it. I can donate this one. You know, so, so, the, you know, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if somebody were to give you that, you wouldn't want it. Like, you would scoff at it. Why would you consider that charity? But anyway, this is what Qabil does. He brings something he doesn't want, basically is garbage. Instead of throwing it away, he says, I'm going to just put it on the altar. And if the fire takes it, great, you know, trash is off my hands. And uh, of course... When, when they present their sacrifice, this sacrifice is to make a decision. 
whoever is sacrificed is accepted means he is the he's the 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 groom he's going to get married and the other one has to be patient until the next set of uh, you know babies come so uh the sacrifice is offered and Qabil's, Qabil's sacrifice is rejected and Habil's is accepted. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees something and he makes something happen, we can't change it, right? For a believer, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us, we believe in the qadr of Allah. The qadr means everything that happened in the past, whether it's good or bad, it is from Allah. And you have to be in a state of acceptance, means accept what happened and move forward with your life. But Qabil, he's unable to let it go. So after, after the whole sacrifice is done, the other brothers, they come and they, they, they congratulate Habil. They say, congratulations, you know, you, you're the one getting married. Qabil, he comes to him and says, Habil, this is not fair. I'm going to kill you because of this. And he starts threatening him and he starts, you know, you know, bringing violence and pushing him and shoving at them. Habil, he realizes this has nothing to do with me or you. This is from Allah. So whatever you do, you do what you want to do. I'm not going to try to hurt you. You know, if, 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 if this went the other way, I would have just said, congratulations. So Habib says, if you try to hurt me, I'm not going to try to hurt you. Definitely, Allah is the one who's watching over us. Allah is the one who's aware of what's going on. Now, up until this point, they don't know the capacity that they have within themselves. The human being, Allah gave us great capacity. And one of the great capacities that we have is we can even take life. We have that ability. Right? It's not right, but certain times, you know, like when you sacrifice an animal, you know, this is this is a this is an indication that Allah has placed great trust in your hands, that you're able to take another living creature's life. So Habil says, I'm going to kill you, and Shaitan entices him to do this and uh, you know keeps on put, you know engulfing these flames. So Habil he calls his brother one day, and uh, while his brother goes to see what's what what he wants, because they're still brothers, you know. Habil goes to visit his brother, Qabil, he hits him over the head with a rock, and he kills his brother. And as soon as he's committed the act, and his brother is on the floor, Qabil becomes filled with remorse. And he doesn't know how to take back what he did. And so he's looking to the left, looking to the right. He doesn't want his father to find out. He doesn't want anybody to see what happened. So he's in a state of panic, and he's trying to you know, get his brother back to, to wake up, but he's not moving. Now he realizes what has happened. What he's done is utterly evil and come from a very dark place. And so at that time, even though he's a murderer, even though he committed a crime, even though he killed his own brother, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows mercy to him by sending two crows. One of them kills the other, and then the, he's watching the crows do this. And then the one that got the, the one that killed the other starts digging the ground and buries the, the, the body of the other crow. So Allah teaches them how to handle death, how to handle the dead body. So Habil, he buries Habil, uh, and then you know he goes to Adam alayhi salam and he pretends like he didn't do it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, because Qabil he started this crime, he's the first person to commit murder. Every time a murder happens in this world, he gets portion of that sin. And the Prophet ﷺ was teaching us something profound in our religion, that every time you start something, if it's good, whoever follows you in that good, not only do they get their reward, but you also get their reward, equal to whatever they did. And whoever starts something bad and others follow them in the evil, not only do they get their sins, but you also get the sin of them doing it. Right? So we became agents of good or evil. And whatever action you start then, it has a ripple effect down in history. Everything you do, it's not just for this moment. So you're living your life right now, think about 10 generations later. How's your great, great grandchildren gonna be because of this? And this is, this is how Ibrahim السلام, used to think. As he's building the Kaaba, he's thinking, how's my great, great, great children gonna be? So he starts making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, you know, send the prophet amongst them who will guide them, who will teach them. So you, we have to think long term. And the Prophet وسلم, told us that if you are righteous, right? If you're righteous, Allah will protect your children. And our scholars, they also got that from Surah Al Kaf. In Surah Al Kaf, there's orphans. They have nobody to protect them, and they have some wealth that's about to be exposed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends 
Khidr alayhi salam and Prophet Musa alayhi salam to go and build the wall back up. Why? Because these orphans, their parents were good people. So because they're good people, Allah protected their children and their children and their children. So our scholars have said, your good deeds can go up to seven generations affecting your family. And your bad deeds can also what? Go down seven generations. Now that doesn't mean your great grandchildren will have the, the sin of what you did, but they might have the effects of that sin. They may have the consequences of that sin. And so, you know, just think every action that, that we do that has a consequence that, that ripples down in history and affects many generations after. So Habil, of course, after he did this, his behavior, his actions start to affect rippling down generation after generation. And, uh, and the, the, the descendants of Habib, they, they started to swerve from the straight path. And they, they became, a, of course, Habib is dead. So who married the sister? Habib did. And so, so, so they had the, the, their, their descendants and other things. They, they, they start to, to forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And about 10 generations later, so they said between Adam alayhi salam and uh, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, there was 10 qarn. 10 qarn means either a thousand years or 10 generations. 10 generations later, people had already forgot the reality of Islam, even though they're, they're so close to Adam alayhi salam. They had another prophet named Sheath, was one of the, they said, some of the scholars said, he's one of the sons of uh, Adam alayhi salam. Allah knows best, we don't have much knowledge about him. Um, but 10 generations later, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam enters the picture. And the people are already worshiping idols. People are worshiping statues and stones. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Nuh alayhi salam that, you know, here's a message to guide your people. And so Nuh alayhi salam starts having interactions with angels. And in that time, this is something that, you know, if, you know, some people had experiences with angels because humanity is still new, but none of them received revelation in the way the messengers received. And so Nuh alayhi salam starts receiving not just knowledge, he starts receiving messages from Allah, he starts receiving instructions on what to do, what not to do. So he goes and he invites people. And the people of Nuh alayhi salam, they already have different social classes. They have uh, rich people, they have poor people, they have those super wealthy elite. They have, so they, they've already now established a government, they have villages, they have towns. So, you know, people had already gone into what we call hayat dunya the, the, the hustle and bustle of this worldly life. And already they have this caste system. There's the people that are, that are up on top of the world. They think they're the, they're the rulers and the, the elite. And then there are people that are, that are the beggars on the street. They're the, you know, the, the, the untouchables and all these kind of things going on. So when Nuh salam comes, part of his message is, oh mankind, Allah created you all from the same parents. Your father and my father is all uh, all, you know, all of our mothers is Hawa, or you know, our, our mother Hawa. So we're all equal in the sight of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala as brothers and sisters. This is the first message. And the, the the ones that were you know in the in the higher position socially, they didn't like that. They said, No, we understand you're trying to give all these nice things to teach us all these things, but this concept we don't like it. Get away from the poor people, and then we'll listen to you. So this was the first you know thing that they said. We don't want to talk to you or be seen around you as long as you're talking to the poor people. As long, when you shun away the poor people, then we'll talk to you. Nuh alayhi salam, he says, what's the matter with you? They're human beings and you're human beings. You know, and uh, you know, so, so this message is for all of the mankind. So he starts teaching them about the oneness of Allah, about the reality of you know, the day of judgment, about the coming of the end of times, about Jannah, about hellfire. And in his flock, people that listen to him are very few, even though every year people are practically doubling in, in population. And so Nuh salam, he lives a long time. He lives 900, more than 950 years. But for 950 years, he's a messenger, he's a prophet of Allah, and he's calling people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures a, a dua of Nuh salam in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nuh. Nuh salam is now an old man and he's exhausted. He's been inviting people to Allah his entire life. Imagine 950 something years, right? We talk to somebody for three days and they don't listen, what happens? We said, the heck with you, you wanna to go to hell, go to hell, you know? But Nuh he didn't give up. 
He didn't give up on people. He didn't give up on, on the message. He, he tried his best. And so he starts making dua to Allah. He says, Ya Allah, I call them in the daytime and I call them in the nighttime. I went to them publicly and I went to them privately. He's basically saying, I took every means possible. Like if, if he had Twitter back then, he tweeted about Islam. If he had Facebook, he had messages posted about Islam. If he had YouTube, he had made videos about Islam. If he had Instagram, all of his posts was about Islam. Like he, you know, private message people, direct message them, put public, you know, so he went at it at every direction. If he had newspapers, he posted articles. Like if he had websites, he had, like he did everything. But what he says, he says, all my calling them did nothing except add them to be further away from me. And as I'm inviting them, they covered their ears with their hands and they wrapped their clothes around them. And basically it got to a point like they would see Nuh salam coming down. It's like, oh man, it's him again. He's going to come here and talk to us about being Muslims. Let's run away, right? Before he even comes, they run away. Or as he's talking to them, hey, salam alaikum neighbor. You know, listen, in, as he's starting to talk to them, the guy takes his shirt and covers his head and ducks and runs away like that. Like imagine people did that to you, right? If they did that to you, you'd be like, man, you don't want it? Fine, <laughs> you know, get away from me. But Nuh salam, was so patient with them, so patient with them. So he's asking Allah, like, what do I do, Ya Allah? Like, they're, they're being further and further away from me. And he says, وَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ And I told them to seek forgiveness from your Lord. That's what he's telling them. Just make istighfar. إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا And he's most forgiving. يُرْسِلُ عَلَيْكُمُ السَّمَاءَ مِدْرَارًا And he's going to send you rain from the sky. وَيُرْزِقْهُمْ you know, you know, بِأَمْوَالِ وَبَنِينَ And he's going to give you more children. And he's going to give you all kinds of wealth. Just He's telling them the benefits of seeking Allah's forgiveness. He's telling the benefits of being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything you have is from Allah. Why would you turn your back to him? So he's telling them to turn back to Allah. And at his time, they had all these statues that they were worshipping. And our scholars they said these statues were actually statues of righteous people that lived in the, in the time of Adam alayhi salam or the next generation. So from the time of Adam alayhi salam and his children's generation, they, some of them became teachers and scholars. And they were teaching and advising others. And the people would say, we got to remember this guy. He was amazing. This sheikh, he was awesome. So they built statues of them, right, to remember them. And uh, shaitan followed up with their children, said, you remember why your parents built these things? He's like, yeah, that was my dad's uh, sheikh, right? Great grandchildren comes. Shaitan comes and says, Remember why your great great grandfather built this statue? I don't know. My dad said something about him being a great person. And so it's like, all right, they forgot about them. They don't have books, they don't have you know history in that sense. He said, these were actually images of God. And your great great parents, your ancestors, they remember it from heaven because they came from heaven. So so they're here to be worshipped. That's why they built them. So by this time now, they're worshiping them because people wanted to have a Kodak moment with their, with their shiuch, you know, they built statues of them. So slowly, slowly, idolatry had crept in. And now people were so used to it. They had customs, they had uh, all kinds of parades around it. They had all kinds of celebrations. They had all kinds of rituals that when Nuh salam told them, La ilaha illallah, God is one, you don't have to do these things. They felt attacked to their core. Why are you telling me? My father was sitting here worshiping this idol and you're coming and telling me that I shouldn't? You know, I'm following the footsteps of my ancestors. The, little did they know their ancestors were what? Muslims, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. But now they've lost their original tradition and shaitan has introduced his own tradition. For example, even today, they have a celebration called Burning Man, right? Where you know, thousands of people, they gather in front of the beach and they build this, you know, in the desert, they built this giant statue of a human being, and then they burn it. And then, then they dance around it, and they have all these parties. This practice existed in the ancient pagan times. So how did it come back? Shaitan is always bringing back the same things. Because you know, this trick worked, let's do it again. You know, so now the people had become so accustomed to it. Nuh is like, Ya Allah, how do I call them away from this darkness and from this evil and from this heedlessness and bring them to you? All of this calling that I did, it didn't do anything to increase them, but also they, they're running away from me now. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him a news that breaks his heart. He says, oh Nuh, from this day on, no one else is going to believe you. 
No one else is going to follow you. This was all the people that are going to follow you. How many people? About 80 people. For 950 years, the fruits of his labor is about 80 believers, and they're from the poor communities. And his own family has attitudes about Islam. His own wife has attitudes about Islam. So Nuh is like, whoa, this is it? Like, okay, so everybody else is going to follow the, the satanic way. Everybody else is going to follow the dark way. So Nuh at, at his time, thinking what he was thinking, he says, Ya Allah, then destroy all of them. And imagine like how much he had to think about it before he made that dua. He says, Ya Allah, then destroy all of them because they're not going to have you know, any more children except they're all going to follow their way because you know, th this is all of the believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, Nuh, we will accept your dua. And so build an ark under our guidance. So Nuh alayhi salam is, you know, in that time they're living on top of the mountain. Nuh alayhi salam is told to build an ark. And so he comes out and he's chopping down trees and he's inventing building this, this giant ark and the people are laughing at him. Like, what are you doing? We knew you were crazy. We knew you had lost your mind, but now you're building a ship on top of the mountain. There's no water anywhere. And they start making fun of him. And even the people that were believers with him, when they see what's happening, even they get shaken a little bit. Like, yo, we thought this guy was a prophet. They're right. What is he doing? Right. So, so they start even questioning. And it gets to a point that even the small amount of believers he had to start dwindling in numbers. And all of this, وسلم, be patient, be patient, because eventually the people that are on the straight path, they're going to be successful. And Allah is going to send his mercy to you in whatever form that he chooses. And so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending his mercy to the family of Nuh salam and to the believers in the form of this ark. And the mercy didn't just come from the sky. They had to do what? They had to work for it. They had to build it. And so Nuh salam, imagine how long he, he a couple of years, he was building this ark. And uh, our ulama, they said, people that talk about Allah's mercy in a way that they think is just going to come to you without you do anything. They've misunderstood what this, this reality means. The Prophet ﷺ said, tie your camel and have your trust in Allah. Right? If you want to go to Jannah, the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, make more sajda, increase your sujood. means do your prayers and hope for, for, for mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do whatever you're supposed to do, but know that Allah's mercy is there. And even what you're doing is from Allah's mercy. So Nuh salam, he builds this ark. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him to go and get two of every animal, male and a female, and put it on the ark. And there's a debate amongst their scholars whether this was a, a local event or a global event. When, when, when the things started happening, did it happen just in that one region or did it happen across the globe? And our ulama they said, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to preserve the animals, it means it was a global event. And so Nuh alayhi salam, he goes and brings two of each animal, a male and female. So he got two horses, two cows, two camels. So this was a huge thing, you know? And, and once all of them are embarked, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, now call the believers to get on the board, get on the ark, because the moment has come. And so he, he's, he's going to everybody's house, come, it's time to go, he's come, it's time to go. So they're all coming and then it starts raining. The sky starts pouring rain. And then he notices the earth is also shaking and, and water gazers are coming out and, and springs are popping open from every direction. So water falling from the sky, water coming out from the, under the earth. And all the believers, they rush to the ark and they get on there. And Nuh is like checking, you know, everybody here, he's got this, you know, when the teacher calls your name at the roll, he's calling roll to see who's here, who's not here. Everyone's there except his wife and his son. So he's now in, in a state of panic. He's like, my son is not here. My wife is not here. So he's looking around and he's seeing water rising and he's seeing people panicking and running up the mountain. So he's calling for his son. He says, my son, where are you? He sees his run, son, son running up the mountain. He says, get on the ark with us. His son says, leave me alone, father. I'm done with your nonsense. His son, at the last moment, he exposes who he is. He says, I'm done listening to you. I'm done following you. You're crazy. I'm going to go find refuge in the mountain. And he says to his son, oh, my son, nothing will help you this day except Allah's mercy. Get on the ark with us. And his son refuses. And as he's calling and he's shouting and he's pleading and he's begging, 
the wave starts you know, forming on the ocean and Allah says a, a wave separated between the two of them, a size of a mountain. So a wave washed up equal to the size of the mountain and he saw his son drown in front of his eyes. Now Nuh salam is terrified. Everybody on the ship is terrified because they're seeing all their homes go underwater. They're seeing all the people drowning and they're in a state of panic and shock. The sky is like thunder and lightning. And so, so everybody's taking shelter on this ark. And this ark, as huge as it was, it's like a little tiny box on this ocean. And these waves are as, as big as mountains and it's being thrown this way and that way. And it's only Allah's mercy that saved them on that day. And uh, you know, one, of, one of my teachers, he said he, one time he was in a boat. He was in a boat and they got caught up in a, in a, in a little bit of uh, waves, storm. And the water started rocking back and forth. And, the, and, and, and what happened, people start holding on to the ship and they, they thought the ship is going to save their life. Of course, everybody got back safely. But he said he had a profound realization at the moment when they thought there was nothing standing between them, between life and death, except this boat. He said, I realized this boat was the only thing between life and death. And then it hit him that it's not the boat. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though you're right now, you feel safe sitting on your house, right? There is nothing between life and death that's holding you back except Allah's mercy. There's, there's nothing you can hold on to to save your life. It's, it's Allah's mercy that's keeping you alive. If Allah wanted to, at this moment, without any reason, without any cause, the heart could stop beating. And it happened to one of our relatives two weeks ago. He was just sitting down, talking with his family, having tea. And, uh, you know, the, the, the daughter said, let me help you get upstairs, father. He said, no, go do your own thing. And so she turned and she walked away and she just heard him drop. She turned around and saw her father is gone in an instant, and they were just talking, right? So nothing is between, holding you from life and death except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's no means that's protecting you except Allah's mercy. So Nuh alayhi salam is shouting and he's sad and what happens now, things start to cool down. The entire earth is flooded. The earth was an ocean, ocean planet at that, at that moment. And there's only one ark that's floating. When it landed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he commanded the earth, to swallow up the water. So as the earth start, started to swallow the water, the, the, the ark of Nuh salam landed on a mountain called Judi. And Nuh salam then started pleading with Allah. He said, Ya Allah, because he still has hope because Allah told him, I'm going to save you and your family and the believers. So he says, Ya Allah, uh, you promised me that you would save my family. And your promise is true. He's hoping to find out, did you save my son some other way? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh Nuh, you're asking me about things about which you have no knowledge. Your son was not from your family. His action was not righteous and he followed the disbelievers. So he met the end of the disbelievers. And, and guess who asked for that? Nuh alayhi salam made dua for that. Oh Allah, destroy all the disbelievers. He didn't know it was going to include his son. He didn't know it was going to include his wife. But our scholars said, we can learn from this that you have to be very careful what you ask for. Even the prophets, when they ask for something, you know, they, they, they their dua, but they had to pray about their dua. And so, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, told Nuh alayhi salam, your son was not from your family. His action was not righteous. And so the prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, the bond of the faith, the, the, the relationship that you have with each other, based on your deen, based on Islam, is actually more higher in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the bond and the relationship of blood. And this ayah was revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in Mecca when people were accepting Islam and their parents were not accepting Islam. Or one would become Muslim and his brother would remain a non-Muslim. And not just what was one becoming Muslim and one not, they were fighting each other and they were trying to kill each other. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is you know, being told that your real family are the people of Iman. And those that follow the, the, the way of others, at that time, you know, they're not considered your family. If they're fighting against you, they're, they're your enemy. If they're trying to kill you, then, then you know, you have to, and if the, the, the calamity befalls the disbelievers and they, they're included in that, then you have, to, you have to surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our scholar, what we learned from this is we have to make dua for our families, 
no matter what their state is, we have to ask Allah to protect them and to guide them and to forgive them and to show them the right way, even if you get fed up with them. Even if you get into a state of, of, of you know, you think there is no hope for them. You're not a prophet, right? Some people, they, they try to guide their family members for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and then they say, ah, the heck with you, this guy is, there's no hope. Nuh salam didn't give up after 20 years. He kept on, you know, trying to, to work on his, on his people for how long? 950 years. So if you give up after 950 years, no problem. You have, you have an excuse. But Nuh salam didn't even give up after 950 years. He only made that dua that he made after Allah told him, this is it, nobody else. Then he said, okay, then if that's the case, then destroy them, all right? But uh, our scholars have said one of the things that we can learn from here is never give up on the people. Never give up on the people that you love. Always keep them in your duas because Allah might save them, Allah might forgive them, Allah might guide them, and uh, you don't know the eventual outcome. But this story, as you saw, the ending of the disbelievers was a calamity. Right? They, they died and they, they, were, they were drowned. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we made them a sign for mankind. So, so this was a big sign for mankind living at the end of times. But our scholars said this type of uh, punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it seized with all the previous prophets. The prophets had not yet realized the, the, the magnitude of Allah's mercy. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came, he was given the same choices to make dua for people against people that were opposing him. He said, no, Allah's mercy is greater than that. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a message to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He said, Allah will never punish them for as long as you're with them. And Allah will never punish them as long as they're seeking forgiveness. And so part of the blessing of being in the end of times is that this type of calamity is no longer going to happen. If, even if it happens, it happens locally. And it happens with the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but not as a punishment. It comes down as, as, as a purification. But in the previous nations, it happened as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we being from the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our prophet is a prophet of mercy. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we ask Allah for mercy for, for, for all the people of his ummah. And don't ever think that only Muslims belong to his ummah. The Muslims and the non-Muslims, they all belong to the Ummah of Muhammad Except the only difference between them is the Muslims are the ones who responded to the invitation. The non-Muslims have not yet responded. Right? But it doesn't mean they're not from the Ummah of Muhammad Rasulullah made dua for all of them, all of humanity. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and, and to forgive us and to guide us. This is the story of Nuh uh, If you have any questions, we open the floor now. You can you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can put it in the chat. No questions. You're muted, Ali. I can't hear you. Oh yeah. Um. Sorry. I was just gonna ask. Um. For Hazrat Nu, um, there's only mention of one son, but if he uh, was alive for about 950 years, um, did he have like many generations of uh, children or just- It's possible, only yes. It's, it's, it's definitely, see the thing with the Quran, the Quran, it gave us lessons, right? So even the stories, historical events that were mentioned, they were not mentioned as historical events that we can learn history from it. They were mentioned in a way that we can draw lessons from it and we can benefit from it for our own lives. And so that's why if you look at, for example, at the, at the Bible, they try to keep a record of who had how many sons, at what age did they live, at what time did they live, all those things. But for us, any detail that's mentioned, it was mentioned with the purpose of getting some kind of lesson, getting some kind of wisdom from it. Even the, the time that he gave Dawah, the 950 years, is mentioned to teach us patience, you know? So, so it's possible that he had more children and their details are not mentioned. Uh, because humanity is as diverse as it is, it's, it's, uh, 
you know, there is a documentary now they're doing called Scientific Adam that they said everywhere you go, you find the Y DNA has certain markers that go back to the same original person uh, in Africa. So all of humanity, they're now confirming, comes from the same family. And uh, the, you know, in, their, in their search, they find that it starts to uh, expand with few generations that became many. But uh, some of the scholars, they said, they said that this scientific Adam that they're finding is actually scientific Nuh, alayhi salam. And the rest of humanity is from his from his descendants. Allah Alam. How did we how did he know how to build the ark? Okay. Uh, the, the ayah says clearly that build the ark uh, with the wahi. So he had revelation and on, on how to build the ark, including its plans and uh, what kind of wood to use, how how to cut them, and all that stuff. So he had he had definitely help. He, Allah sent him angels, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. The, the knowledge of it and all of that stuff. So this was, uh, you know, early, early construction. Any, any other questions? Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, if we have no questions, I have a question for you. What do you find uh, to be most beneficial from the story of Nuh Ali Salaam? Um, I think for me, it's what you had said earlier about um, how, like I, I knew that um, my husband who had lived for 950 years, but I didn't under, like, really understand that um, for 950 years, day after day, he'd been preaching Islam again and again. Uh, without giving up how many had only gone 80 members but he didn't give up not even till the end until Allah told him that he didn't have any more followers yeah. so um, yeah just that les lesson of patience and perseverance um, the um, and and you really have to if you want to understand Nuh salam, you really have to put yourself in his shoes and imagine yourself watching generation after generation Children that you watch grow up get lost and lose their way and go into, you know, and, and you see it happen again and again in front of your eyes. Oh my God, that's got to be, that's, that's got to be painful what he went through. Oh, and one of the, the challenges that the people they brought to him, they said, you know, we're not going to listen to you because you're a human being just like us. You know, you eat food and you see you in the marketplace. Why should we listen to you? And, and, and this is a fundamental thing. So you'll, you'll notice the same argument is made against all of the prophets. You're just a human being. Allah tells them, tell them, yes, I am just a human being. But Allah is not going to talk to everybody, right? Allah chose one person, the best amongst you, to represent them. Because you're of Allah, you're a representative of Allah. And so our, our religion is built upon recognizing the human spirit. Every single one of you has a spirit, and that spirit is at different places. Some of you can be great awliya of Allah, and you don't know it. Right? And some of you can be saints. Some of you, when you have little siblings, you don't know who that person is. They could be a big scholar in the future, right? Because they have certain mission that Allah sent them with. You know, and you could be that person. Allah wa'ala. There, there, there are people that are so close to Allah. Miracles happen around them, um, and they're representatives. And we take our religion from them and we, we obeying them is like obeying Allah. Obeying the prophets is like obeying Allah because they're not speaking from their own self, right? They're, they're speaking from a revelation that's coming to them. So, so, you know, we'll talk about this more inshallah, the concept of Nubuwa. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Ahmad Khan said, me too, Ibrahim. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, the wrath of Allah Alhamdulillah, wrath of Allah is very dangerous. We ask Allah for protection from that. But also we have to recognize Allah's wrath is even a function of his mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is actually encompassing all things. If he was to unleash unlimited wrath, that is, that is from the level of Allah's power, you know, there, there's nothing would have existed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala limits even the pain we feel, right? Because of his mercy. Like if you... Get into a car accident, what happens? 
from the outside, it looks like, oh man, the guy is in a lot of pain and everything. But the person, as soon as he's hit, he blacked out. He doesn't feel any pain. So the mercy then came in and enveloped him. So, so don't focus too much on the wrath without, without balancing it with Allah's mercy. And, and, and that way you can, you can have a bird that flies. I said, because fear and hope is like the two wings of the bird. If you don't have the both of them, you can't fly. Okay. Do we know what the final resting place of? Yeah, it was in the Mount Judy, uh, modern day called Ararat. It's in Turkey, in, in the country of Turkey. Uh, is Prophet Nuh alayhi salam known as second Adam or is that false? Um, Allahu Alam. You, you asked that, Ali? Yeah, so, so the, some of the scholars, they said that the, the humanity then, you know, started with Nuh alayhi salam. So, so the previous generation, they got wiped away. So Allahu Alam, Allah knows best. But uh, some of the scholars do argue that from Nuh alayhi salam, because Allah says in the Quran, Allah chose the family of them, the family of Nuh and the family of Ibrahim uh, over all of mankind. And uh, if you notice, these are patriarchs. Patriarchs uh, means they, they represent all of humanity. Adam alayhi salam represents all of humanity. Ibrahim alayhi salam is the father of all the monotheistic religions, right? He's a patriarch. All the prophets came from his progeny. Uh, Nuh alayhi salam, same thing. So Allah alam, Allah knows best. Um, any other questions? All right, so don't give up on people, but also don't give up on yourself. If you find yourself doing anything wrong, Always turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always try to do good. And the good washes away the bad. The Prophet also said, if you did something bad, follow it up with something good. And the good washes away the bad as if it never happened. And then Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful. And uh, like I said again, uh, Allah's wrath is not going to come down on the believers for as long as they're seeking Allah's forgiveness. So one thing we can learn is he said, if you make istighfar, not only will Allah forgive you, he'll give you money, he'll give you family, he'll give you wealth, he'll give you rain, he'll give you all the blessings. So that's one of the things Nuh was inviting his people to. So we can take that from him and, and uh, make istighfar. What, is, what does it mean to make istighfar? You know what to say? Astaghfirullah. You just say astaghfirullah. The Prophet said, I used to say astaghfirullah. 100 times every day, at least. So the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah is to say Astaghfirullah at least 100 times. And some of our scholars said he used to say it 100 times after Fajr and 100 times after Asr. So this was the practice of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he doesn't have any sins, but he used to say Astaghfirullah. So make it a practice if you can, say Astaghfirullah, and there's a lot of spiritual benefits to it. You may not see it in this world, but you'll definitely see it in the Day of Judgment. Inshallah. All right, let's conclude. Go ahead, Ali. Yep, so um, I really have no comment after that. That was an amazing halakah. Um, just want to say jazakallah khair for this way. Uh, jazakallah for coming. Um, and we'll have our next halakah in two weeks, inshallah. 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 Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.